You ask the questions, we do our best to answer them. That is the premise of our weekly Ask GC Anything show, which is here right now. Before we get started though, if you are new to the sport and you've got a newbie question which you're slightly embarrassed to ask, don't be. We all got into the sport at some point, we all had to learn from somewhere, and that is exactly what this show is all about. So we'll start off with a newbie question which comes in from Poem Podoem Poex, who asks, so I see you guys talking about KOM a lot, but I wondered what exactly is a KOM? Well, in our modern app-driven world, they often refer to Strava segments, whereby there is a specific segment of road and the leading male rider is given the KOM status, the king of the mountains, and the leading female is given the QOM, which is queen of the mountains. However, before the invention of Strava, it was all about the best climber, mainly in stage races. And the most noteworthy, of course, being at the Tour de France. So across the 21 stages which make up that race, there are various categorised climbs from fourth cat all the way through to all category. Riders cumulatively amass a number of points throughout those 21 stages, and whoever has the most gets the KOM jersey, a rather noteworthy polka dot affair, on the Champs-Élysées podium in Paris. And in fact, we've got that jersey, along with all the others explained in this next video. Tour de France jerseys, what are they? The Maillot à Point, awarded to the winner of the best climber competition. It was first introduced in 1933. Similar to the green jersey, the King of the Mountains is decided on a points-based system. These points can be picked up on certain climbs en route. Our next question comes in from Rob Keenan, who says, I'm just wondering if your FTP, functional threshold power, is the same whether you're climbing or riding on the flat. Well, that's a very good question, and the answer is not necessarily. A lot of people find it much easier to get a high power out on a climb versus on the flat, and we think that's down to the pedaling style. So on a climb, your bike is constantly trying to slow itself down far more than it would be on the flat. So you've always got a resistance to push through right the way through the pedal stroke. Whereas on the flat, you tend to go at a slightly higher cadence, and due to that different power transfer through the pedal stroke, some people find it harder to get that same power output out. That's not the same case for everybody. Some people might have it the other way around, although that is more rare. And there's also a discrepancy often between what somebody can do out on the open road and what they can do indoors on a turbo trainer. So yes, you can have a different FTP in different scenarios. Now, if you'd like to improve your climbing, we're going to throw now to one of our first ever videos, almost four years ago here on GCN, how to improve your climbing. Some riders think Alberto Contador and myself are simply more comfortable climbing out of the saddle. So if you're a bit more experienced and you don't feel like you can get all of your power out in the saddle, then do what feels comfortable. Vary it, it will ease the pain. When you're out of the saddle, change up to a bigger gear because you'll want a lower cadence. Change back into an easier gear when you sit down. It's the quick fire round, so let's get going. First question comes in from Stefano Balani, who asks, why don't track bikes have brakes? Another very good question, and one that I didn't really know the answer to. Not coming from a track background, it's very alien to me too. In the two or three times that I've been on the track in my lifetime, I've really wanted to be able to grab a handful of brakes when I wanted, but apparently, reading up on this, that is the reason why I don't have brakes, because it's even more dangerous in a pack of track cyclists to be able to slow down suddenly than it is out on the open road in a peloton. So it's for safety reasons, apparently. Uh, Jan Boyas is flat belly or round belly. Who is more aero? Well, if Lasty continues the way he is, we might be able to test that out in the wind tunnel in the not too distant future. My hunch would be that a fat belly would actually be slightly more aero because it would fill in the void that you have here that collects a lot of air when you're riding along in an aero position. And some riders have in fact experimented with using camelbacks on their front here to make themselves more aerodynamic, but definitely one for us to use in the wind tunnel in the not too distant future. Yusuf A writes in, he's asked this before apparently, I'm wondering if there are any pro cycling teams with male and female riders, is it a good idea to have that? And is it legal under the UCI regulations for female pro riders to participate in major men's races such as the Tour de France? Well, to answer your last part first, no, females are not allowed to participate in the Tour de France. But yes, there are teams which have both a male and a female side to them, notably Orica Greenedge, of course. And my very own Cervelo Test team back in the day had both a male and a female team. Uh, Lucy Martin was a part of the Garmin team when I was there, which had of course, both male and a female team. And yes, of course, it's a good idea. And I think there's a call for more men's teams to have a female side to them as well. Next up, Darren Rosamond, 
Could you please let me know if you're getting the red bottles back in stock? Well, yes, we are hoping to again in a not too distant future, but you can imagine that we're quite reluctant to give you an exact date on when they're going to arrive, given Bottlegate last time. But look out for them at some point in the new year. Next up from Gallia Nintendo. I will keep asking if an F1 engineer invented a rhinoplasty that massively improved air uptake, would a cyclist with that be a cheat? First up, I'm going to pretend to understand the terminology that you have used, even though I don't. It wouldn't be against the rules if a cyclist found a way of becoming suddenly much more aerodynamic on current rules. Of course, the UCI, as we've seen many times in the past, do have the ability to change the rules as and when they want, which is why bikes have to be certain dimensions, etc., etc., and why Graham O'Brien's bike has been banned in the past. Next up, Michael Ruel has a quick question. I find it difficult to stand when riding on my home train. I generally want to stand during some of the recovery sections of my session, but it seems to be different than when I'm out on the open road. Is there a technique issue or just a general thing about trainers? Well, it's probably another thing that a lot of people do find. And the reason is that you can't swing your bike slightly from side to side on a fixed home trainer as you would do out on the road. So it does me feel a lot more alien trying to get out of the saddle on an indoor train, although you do get some these days which do tilt slightly side to side, giving you a very road-like feel. Finally, Nathan Smith says, is it better to do a session, e.g. sprints or sweet spot efforts, on an indoor trainer or on the road? Well, I would say that with sprints, you're probably better off doing them out on the open road, unless you've got a very, very sturdy indoor trainer or something like a watt bike. Otherwise, it can be hard to get out your maximum power. In terms of sweet spot and FTP efforts, well, actually on the indoor trainer, they can be very good indeed because you've got to really concentrate on the effort. There's nowhere to hide, there's no downhill, there's no parts where you're going to stop pedaling, but not necessarily any better than out on the open road. The next question comes in from Sam Faulkner. Uh, he's got a question about pulling up on his pedals. Doesn't think he's doing it enough. Is there an ideal ratio between push and pull? What methods do you recommend to gauge how much you pull up and increase your pull technique and strength? Well, this is an interesting one because there have been scientific studies done in the past which show that pro riders actually have a bigger differential between how much power they put on the downstroke versus on the upstroke. So it might be that we don't need to attempt to maximize the power through the bottom and top of the pedal stroke or even on the upstroke. You might be better training the bigger muscles which do all of the pushing down. If you're really determined to make sure that you do pull up as much as possible, you can try some single leg drills, but maybe you don't need to. We actually did an experiment in a laboratory ourselves a few years ago, uh, flat versus clipless pedals to see if there was any power differential between being able to pull up and not being able to pull up at all. And you can see the results of that in this next video. <laughs> Okay, well now we've swapped the pedals over for some standard flat ones with some normal mountain bike pedals which Sai is riding on the treadmill now. Exactly the same conditions, we're on the same incline of 6% and the same speed of 20 kilometers per hour. Before we give you or even Sai some of the numbers from the last test or doing this one, Sai, how is it actually feeling at the moment from your point of view? Our last question comes in from Angel Caceres Lisona. He uh, says, this might be a dumb question, but do you guys, all pro riders, use sunscreen when you're riding? I think I should start using it, but to be honest, I don't like it, so do you think it's enough to use body cream? Well, the answer from my perspective is yes, and I know that the other GCM presenters all use sunscreen too, but we've all got fairly fair skin, so we get burnt quite quickly if we don't. But of course, from a purely safety perspective, it's very important to use sunscreen, especially in very hot climates such as Southern Europe or Australia or parts of the United States. But in general, whenever the sun's out, from my perspective, I would thoroughly recommend it. If you're not getting on well with it, try using some different ones to see if there are some that suit you slightly better. In terms of the body cream, well I guess it just depends whether it protects you from UV light. From the pros perspective, we know that they do use sunscreen as well, at least the majority of them do, because back at the Vuelta España a couple of years ago, we asked them what factor they were using, and coming up are their answers. Um, factor 50 is pretty much all you can do, wear this jersey and uh, keep as cool as possible but it's pretty hard. 50? Uh, I don't go much more than 30. Do a good, good 30 SPF, I think, is good enough. I just put a bit of 50 on my nose and with these jerseys as well, because they're quite thin, you have to put a 50 on the back as well, but on the arms and legs, I don't use anything. Probably should, but I just, uh, I don't know. I don't burn now once I get a decent tan. Quite like getting a nice brown, you know, so. 
Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget to keep on sending in your questions by leaving them in the comments section down below, or if you prefer on social media, using the hashtag TalkBack. Got time for one more quick question from SG Base. Any chance of a full-time female presenter? Well, yes, we have been looking for a full-time presenter for quite some time, and we are hoping to get one very soon. Lucy Martin has done some videos for us very recently. Whether or not we can persuade her to be alongside us full time remains to be seen. But this next video is her examining whether or not you need to purchase a women specific bike. Down here, meanwhile, is our very own Simon Richardson who looks into whether a road bike can perform as a cyclocross bike, which is very interesting indeed. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already by clicking on the globe. And if you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up.